You're listening to Nightlight Radio Network. This is Dr. Bob Hieronymus, co-host of 21st Century Radio. We are happy to present this rebroadcast of our show on Nightlight. You know, about 40 years ago, 40 years ago, I was a member of a number of uh, secret societies that, that taught that the lost years of Jesus, that is, about the time of his 12th or 13th year, to, to his 30th year, plus, 30 maybe, plus, uh, were spent journeying to living in and studying in India. Now, they also taught that Jesus didn't die on the cross, but was nursed by his family back to life, whereupon, after he recovered, he returned to India and was buried there. Now, we've touched on this topic several times on 21st Century Radio, but it wasn't until two, the year 2000 that we interviewed Ed Martin on this important research and, um, he's, and his just-published then book called King of Travelers, Jesus Lost Years in India. Now, here we are nine years later, and Ed Martin's work has been expanded in two ways. He has an updated book called Jesus in India, King of Wisdom, and a film by Paul David's Jesus in India. And in my opinion, this film and this book are the best research on this topic. And if you have the courage to seek the truth, then it's a necessary read or watch. I wish I would have had these in my hands 40 years ago. Because all of the stuff that we learned in these various societies were secret. We weren't allowed to talk about it. And we were always looking for another source, which was a good documented source. Now we got one. We don't have to worry about that. Just forget that secret societies teach that, friends. It doesn't matter anymore. (laughs) Well, you know, courage is uh, what you need because the author of this book, Edward T. Martin, needed a great deal of it. Why? Well, because he was a former fundamentalist from Texas who was ousted from his church for asking unwelcome questions. Now, what kind of unwelcome questions were they? Well, listen to this. Well, actually, basically, this was the answer. They said, if God wanted you to know that, it would have been in the Bible, he was told. So stick to worrying about your own salvation. But that wasn't good enough for Edward T. Martin, who uh, undertook a seeker's quest across 4,000 miles of India in search of of answers and evidence about where Jesus was during the hidden years from ages 12 to 30. And I think uh, joining us, uh, I don't think I know, joining us right now is the man who had the courage to do the film. His name is Paul Davids, but he's a courageous soul. He always has been. Just listen to this. Paul Davids was Marvel Productions coordinator for the original The Transformers TV series and many episodes of which he wrote. And he went on to executive uh, producer of and co-write Showtime's now classic film, Roswell, in 1994, which was nominated for a Golden Globe as Best Motion, motion Picture for Television. He made his directional debut, or debit, as <laughs> we used to say in the old days, with the feature documentary Timothy Leary's Dead in 1997. And I've never seen it. I've never seen it. Now, the husband and wife team of Paul and Hollis Davids are also noted for authoring six of the million-selling Star Wars sequel books in the early 1990s for Lucasfilm. Paul Davids also wrote and directed Starry Night, The Artist and the Shaman, The Sci-Fi Boys, and the latter of which won the prestigious Saturn Award in Hollywood from the Academy of Science Fiction, Fantasy, and Horror, Horror, as best DVD of 2006. Welcome back to 21st Century Radio, and it's only been, Paul, 14 years. I think so, Bob, and I think my resume is getting too long. Yeah, well, that's why we had to edit, edit this down. I it mean, makes, this, this was edited. I'm too old. I've done too much. Well, maybe you shouldn't do so much. Maybe you should take a vacation. Uh, but it uh, has been, uh, uh, well, 1994 is when Roswell came out on Showtime. And I remember you and I had quite an interview at that time about the Roswell incident. Well, of course, the Roswell incident was just made up by a bunch of kids. Yeah. Right. right. Now, there's yeah. nothing that can be concerned about that. Yeah, it wasn't even a weather balloon. I hear it was a balsa wood kite. It was all made up. 
Yeah. It was all made up, and, uh, and to just take a look Somebody at Somebody threw a hubcap. Oh, well, look, look, now we're having an astronaut coming out and actually telling us that, that UFOs exist. What's going on around here? Edgar C. Mitchell, and he's not only announced that uh, there has been contact with aliens and there has been a cover-up, but are you surprised that neither the New York Times nor the Wall Street Journal even printed it? Well, the New York I mean, Times... This man has walked on the moon longer than any other human being alive. There's only a handful of people that ever did walk on the moon, and he's not news, you see. Well, you know how the nasty negatives always talk about astronauts see, who see UFOs? Yeah. They just said they're space jockeys. Come on. All they are, <laughs> all they are is they go around and fly fly uh, jets and stuff. I mean, you know, the, the way they debunk you is so pathetic. I mean, you know. Well, uh, you know, I, I, I've gotten used to the debunking over the years. Well, the it's about subject, time. You know, you, you, you mentioned I did a film on Timothy Leary. Roswell certainly got its round of uh, debunking. And uh, now Jesus in India... Actually, actually, uh, it's really been nicely embraced by a lot of people who feel that it has uh, expanded their awareness. And I, I do think this film is a very even-tempered and uh, fair film in that it gives all sides of the argument uh, a, a chance to air their point of view while pursuing what we think may be the best evidence to fill in the lost years of Jesus. And it... It took a lot of work and thousands of miles of travel and a lot of uh, serendipity to get into places that Westerners usually are not welcome and are not permitted to film. I'll say, I'll say, I was real. That, that's what is so exciting about this. It's a, I'm glad. I'm glad you, know, you love the film. Hey, listen. Let me they, let me start out with a plug because some people might be, you know, online and they need to know that Jesus in India the movie. dot com is where it's all happening with this film. And Jesus in India, the movie, dot com. We now have the DVD out after it's been on Sundance Channel now five times in the U.S. And, he, and Showtime just showed it four times in Australia for Easter. Well, that's what I love about uh, a cable television. I mean, they, you do it. It reaches a, show. a lot of people. Yeah, not just that, but it, sometimes they may put your film on for an entire day. <laughs> No, the, well, the, the stuff that we've done for History Channel and, and, and National Geographic and uh, Discovery, uh, they, they've, they've repeated them sometimes uh, half a day. Uncensored, no advertisements. It, it was really good having it on TV. But for the DVD, I added an extra 80 minutes. I mm -hmm. think, yeah, 80 minutes yeah, 80 of minutes. bonus material. So um, am I exhausted after being on this for four years? You bet. <laughs> well, yeah, 4,000 miles. 4,000 miles and... Uh, in the heat. Uh, what's I mean, that? in the worst time of, 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 of the year. It just worked out that we had to go in the summer and film in the summer, and the heat is... It's like being in Iraq in the summer, and the, the humidity, it's oppressive, and then come the monsoons and the washed-out roads and the terrorists, uh, because we had some close... Uh, brush-ups with terrorism. We went to some dangerous places to film this, too, but, you know, we did it. You know, in, you know, we, we just uh, pressed ahead, and doors kept opening for us, and uh, I really hope a lot of people will, will take a look at, at what we offer and what the evidence is. Well, they, they got it. They got it, because uh, this is, I think, going to be mainstream in a decade or two. Uh, if you don't mind my saying, you think it's going to take that long? <laughs> Look, but, the, the, when you have the New York Times, who won't even focus on this kind of stuff. Of course, it will. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, you know, these yeah, are Bob, very. Fourteen years ago, when you and I were talking about Roswell, did you still think that they'd be, you know, not telling the truth about it even now? I, I mean, thought is... you're you're right, and I I wouldn't have thought that. I would have thought they would have been too embarrassed to keep lying yeah. like that. I mean, yeah. it, you know, that's that's where that's the sickness that we're involved well, in now. Now they're too embarrassed to admit how embarrassed they are. <laughs> All right. Now, that, let's get now into the reasoning as to why this is an extremely important film. Yeah. Uh, and we're, uh, we're, I know we're coming up on a break now, but uh, for, first of all, but I'm just going to kind of introduce this question, and then you're going to study up on it because you probably no, we don't have to. We don't have to go to that break. Okay, I, I, we've got you enough time. You see what happened, Bob? Your sponsor heard what this is about and just pulled out on you. I'm always overruled. <laughs> I'm always overruled. And that's okay with me because lots of times I'm wrong. Now, very much appreciated is the quality of research that uh, 
you guys demanded to and, and that you gathered key authorities on this controversial topic and uh, parts of the, especially would you briefly summarize Ed Martin's views on Jesus in India uh, that is how did he get there why did he go and generally where he went because this is that we're going to lay the, the, the playing field here because that, that's the most important topics as far as I'm concerned Okay, well, you stated the basic problem, which is that the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, don't talk about Jesus from the age of 12 to 30. There's only one sentence in Luke that covers 18 years of the life of Jesus Christ. And that one sentence says, uh, and Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. End of story. Now... In film, we call something like that a jump cut. <laughs> That's a big, you've left a lot of the story on the cutting room floor. Why? <clears throat> Everybody wonders why. It really bothered Ed. And he began to become familiar with some of the uh, esoteric and non-esoteric writings, claiming that Jesus spent at least part of those years in India. Uh, of course, he came across um, the writings of Edgar Cayce, America's sleeping prophet, who uh, did have readings about Jesus that placed Jesus in India for part of those years. He came across the Aquarian Gospel of Jesus the Christ by uh, Civil War soldier Levi Dowling. Now, this, of course, is it was a channeled book, and, uh, and channeling on, on the long list of credibility for me has always been toward the bottom of the list. Well, well, has... How is it channeled? Where does it come from? What? Right. But it's interesting material that has a lot of detail to it and specifically mentions Jesus having been at the Jagannath, at Jagannath in um, Puri, India, which is on the East Coast. And this becomes an interesting little key in the puzzle. But the, the, the most juicy and tantalizing uh, piece of this puzzle comes from a Russian who in 1887 was at a monastery 14,000 feet up in the Himalayas. His name was Nicholas Notovich. He's an explorer. He has an accident there on his horse. He breaks a leg. He, he, he spends weeks and weeks there recovering. He gains the confidence and trust and help and care of the Buddhist lamas or monks who are there. They have many ancient documents at the Himis Monastery, and they present to him ancient scrolls um, called the life of St. Isa, the best of the sons of men. Now, here, this is the core of the mystery right now about those missing 18 years. Who is St. Isa? That is Jesus. Isa is the name for Jesus among not only the Muslims, not only the Hindus, but also the Buddhists. They call him St. Isa. And if you listened to Rick Warren's uh, benediction at the inauguration of Barack Obama, he referred to Jesus at one point as Isa in that right. benediction. Yeah. The first time many Americans may have even heard the name. Now, why the life of St. Isa, the best of the sons of men? It's purportedly hundreds of years old, that manuscript, having been copied and recopied and recopied from manuscripts that go back 2,000 years to just after the crucifixion. We don't have that manuscript to test it to test its age. to te But what we do know is that Nicholas Notovich translated it, he published it against the advice of a cardinal that he knew from the Catholic Church who said, bury this, and he was debunked viciously. He was, you know, assaulted. His, his, his integrity was besmirched. Uh, they called him a liar. They accused him of making the whole thing up. But he didn't. And if you go on the Internet today, you'll find all kinds of uh, Internet sites that still from a, I don't know, you know, from an Orthodox Christian point of view, still try to debunk Notovich and claim that he made it all up. But it's not true that he did. He, he, our journey to India took us, for example, to Calcutta at the Ramakrishna Vedanta Math, which is where a famous, reputable Swami, who's authored many books, Swami Abedananda lived. And about 20, 25 years after Notovich was at the Hemis Monastery, he went there, too, trying to get the answer 
on this manuscript. They showed it to him. He translated again. Guess what? Same translation. Oh, a few words, you know, a little different here, here and there on the edges. But not only did he see it, but now we track it, and in our film you'll see this, to a Russian painter in 1926. This is a really interesting guy, Nicholas uh, Rorick. We're going to pause here for our first break. And we'll return with Nicholas Rourke, and this fellow is really key, not just in regards to this particular area, but in the great seal of the United States. He was the individual that was inspiring those Henry Asgard Wallace, FDR, our president, uh, and others, Morgenthau, to put the reverse of the great seal, the pyramid in the Ina triangle, on the back of the $1 bill. We'll be back with our guest, Paul Davids. Jesus in India, a 2008 film based on the book by Edward Martin. Hello, this is Tom McNear, a remote viewing student of the great psychic Ingo Swan and an original member of the Army's Stargate Psychic Program. You are listening to the amazing 21st Century Radio with Dr. Bob Hieronymus. Okay, our guest, of course, for the remainder of the program is Paul Davids, Jesus in India, a 2008 film based on the book by Edward Martin, but this, the new book actually is not King of Travelers, but Jesus in India, King of Wisdom, the making of the film and the new findings on Jesus' lost years. JesusinIndiaTheMovie.com. Go to JesusinIndiaTheMovie.com. And, of course, we had just talk, touched on Nicholas Rorick, who is hated by fundamentalists more than just about anybody on the planet for all kinds of reasons, <laughs> all kinds of stupid reasons, but, but they, they don't like this guy. Uh, so what, tell us about Nicholas Rorick's possible influence here in 1926. Okay, well, first let me tell you who he was. He was uh, a Russian explorer and remarkable painter. He painted probably more than 2,000 paintings in the Himalayas of uh, the incredible sights at those high altitudes and uh, throughout uh, Tibet and Mongolia and northern India. Um, and he was the third person in this uh, chain of investigation of the mysterious document at Himis Monastery about Jesus' lost years. In 1926, he confirmed, having been to Himis and uh, been shown the document, um, and... Uh, um, I believe it was his brother who was uh, fluent in Tibetan, and, and they translated it again, and they sent reports back to New York, where there is the Nicholas Rourke Museum, open today, and you can see many of these paintings. In any event, these reports confirmed the existence of these ancient documents, claiming that Jesus had been to India and studied with the Buddhist lamas, been with the Hindus during those missing years. And this was published in an important New York newspaper at that time called the New York Sun. So he was number three in the chain of people. Then there were others. There's at least four other witnesses to the fact that this ancient document was at Hemis. We know the document exists. We would love for it to see the light of day. And in the course of our travels to make the movie Jesus in India, this involved not only getting the film crew to Hemis Monastery, and talking to the top monks there. But also going to, I don't know whether to call him the Pope of Hinduism or the ultimate Archbishop of, Pope of Hinduism, but his title is Shankaracharya. And he is a Jagannath, where this uh, manuscript and where Levi Dowling's Aquarian Gospel of Jesus the Christ um, both said that Jesus spent some of these uh, lost years we wanted an interview with the Shankaracharya, supreme authority in Hinduism, and we got it. It was extraordinary. It was impossible. We were told, he'll never see you. You'll never get your picture taken with him. You won't even get in the door. But he heard what we were making the film about, that we wanted to have an interview about. He granted the interview, and it was a fountain of information and absolutely spellbinding in is going out on a limb, if you will, to confirm all of these things that were said in these missing documents, confirming that Jesus was in India, it's part of the knowledge and tradition of the Shankaracharyas, 
um, that his office goes back to before the time of Christ, he claims, uh, that there were ancient temples there at Jagannath. At that time, it was an ancient Hindu learning center. And that Jesus not only traveled there, but also in Banaras, which we now call Varanasi on the Ganges River, and went throughout Kashmir. There are many reports that have placed Jesus in Kashmir. He says it's true that there are ancient documents that confirm it. Paramahansa Yogananda's successor at the uh, Self-Realization Fellowship, her name is Sri Dayamata, she had heard this from the previous Shankaracharya on a trip to the United States, that there are ancient documents at Jagannath that confirm Jesus in India. That Shankaracharya passed away before he could write the book about it. The current Shankaracharya confirms it all, but does not readily produce the documents. So we hear him say that there is a sort of cover-up in the Christian world on this information. But but well, I find even more extraordinary is that, is that here we learn that all the books are not cataloged, and not only that, but the individual that translates has been away for 40 years. Yeah, 50, 50 years. They're headlong. 50, oh, it's right, right, yeah. It's yeah. been a I mean, but the king, and they will so not continue. So they stopped the translation process. Correct. Because Until he comes back. Now, now I've dealt with a lot of skeptics in my life, and because of that, that's one of the things that they would jump on immediately. But to me, that's very reasonable, because you'd have to know about monastery life to understand how they do things. Uh, from, but don't you also have to understand about Buddhism? I mean... Buddhism is a religion that looks at the infinity of time. And, you know, five million years is a twinkle in the eye of uh, creation, mm -hmm. yeah. right? So uh, what is 50 years? I mean, uh, I mean, to them, they laugh and say, you're impatient because, you know, we've, we're slowed down by 50 years. You know, what, what, what shameful impatience. <laughs> and, of course, in the West, we do everything as quickly as we can. We have a problem. We get on it. We try to solve it. We pick up the phone. We call an expert. But in this Buddhist world, this kind of Shangri-La that is uh, devoted to this eternal cosmic peace, things move very slowly. And it's remarkable that we have the testimonies through the years that we have that that document really you know, really does exist. Well, it's also remarkable that you brought all these guys together. I mean, here you have the Dalai Lama, and he says basically that there are conflicts in the name of religion, that religious harmony is very essential, that all traditions carry the same message of love, compassion, forgiveness, tolerance, self-discipline, and contentment, and we need a different way to approach the different religions are a different way to approach different people with a different mental disposition. Now, I have to say, and as a filmmaker, I wanted balance. I went to the Vatican. I spoke to Monsignor Corrado Balducci, an apostolic nuncio of John Paul II. I went to Georgetown University and spoke to two prominent Catholic professors. I spoke to a uh, Catholic Vatican-accredited journalist and even the Bishop of Bareilly, Bareilly in India. Now, from the Vatican, uh, we hear the claim that uh, we can only rely on Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John for reliable information about the life of Jesus, and the suspicion that any documents that exist in India would have been created later. Monsignor Corrado Balducci says, falsa, falsa, in Italian, when confronted with all of this. Let me, let me also mention that he also says they are all inventions passed down through generations by the locals in, in India. And when he was asked if there was a motive why the holy books don't tell about Jesus' life, he says there is no certainty about this, is there? It's all hypothesis. And that that's where, I mean, and all... Well, actually, it's a translator that says that to him, there, that there's no... You're saying there's no certainty that it's all hypothesis. And he... He didn't appreciate being pinned down, but he, you know, he, he um, you, you really hit a, you really hit a brick wall uh, with that. I mean, the point is, Catholicism doesn't accept it. But when you examine his claim that this would have been made up by Hindus, let's say, in later years, let, let's examine it for a moment. Nope, my boss is telling me, nope, you, 
we'll have to begin that uh, we'll, examination. We'll save them in suspense. We'll get the answer after after your break. Okay, with our guest Paul Davids, Jesus in India, a 2008 film based on Edward T. Martin's book, his new book, Jesus in India, King of Wisdom, the making of the film and new findings of Jesus' lost years, uh, because you'll see, you'll get to know Edward pretty well if you uh, watch this DVD. And uh, you can get a copy by going to, actually, go to Jesus in India, the movie.com. Jesus in India, the movie.com. Yes, indeed, we have not touched on any of the, many of the scholars, uh, but I think that the way we're going about this right now will get us to the, just exactly where I wanted to anyway later on, because this was well researched. We'll be back in just a few minutes. And uh, you need to get a copy of this DVD by going, well, go to JesusInIndiaTheMovie.com and check that out for yourself. JesusInIndiaTheMovie.com. What changed my life back in the old days was the Dead Sea Scrolls. And then uh, later on, finding out this other information certainly made a a dent in my head. Uh, Paul, you were talking about Father Balducci. Now, the last time, the last time I remember talking about Balducci was back there in uh, maybe about 10 years ago and then about five years ago when uh, finally he came through with saying it's okay in the Roman Catholic tradition uh, that extraterrestrials or UFOs are acceptable, right? That was that was good. He was very yeah. forward thinking in that way. He, he went to many of the UFO conferences and declared that uh, that the belief in uh, intelligent aliens visiting the earth is not in contradiction with Catholicism. And that you're not going to go to hell if you believe in them, right? Exactly. Good. Jesus said, my father's house has many mansions, etc., etc. But on the issue of Jesus' travels in India, um, Monsignor Corrado Balducci felt that uh, whatever documents anyone could come up with from India would surely be hoaxes that were written you know, long after the time of Jesus. Well, one of the problems with taking this attitude towards it is this. You know, for those who think that these were written by Hindus to bring Christ into contact with them and therefore aggrandize Hinduism, you know, or Buddhism, that the ancient, uh, the translation of these purportedly ancient manuscripts have Jesus as a staunch critic of the Hindu caste system, as a troublemaker who did not approve of the Brahmins, the highest caste, exalting themselves did not uh, approve of the exploitation of the uh, undercasts, such as the untouchables. And they also portrayed Jesus as having violated certain key Hindu precepts, such as that you do not read the, uh, the Vedas, the holy Hindu uh, texts, to the untouchable class. And the claim was that Jesus uh, did that, and that Jesus also objected to the worship of idols and pointed out that all God's children were created equally and are equal in the sight of their father, and that the Hindus nearly assassinated him, that he had to escape with his life. Now, I I would say to you that this is in character with the Jesus that we know from the New Testament. It's very much in keeping with the Jesus who went into the temple in Jerusalem and overthrew the (coughs) tables of the money changers, saying that you will not defile my father's house in this way, uh, showing a, a certain righteous anger and insistence and putting his foot down on what the law was. And according to this life of St. Isa, the best of sons of men, this ancient uh, manuscript that puts Jesus in India, uh, he, uh, he was ultimately viewed as a, <clears throat> a troublemaker to the Orthodox uh, Hindus. Now, would Hindus have written that? No, no. Would they have portrayed a, a, a Jesus who wasn't, uh, you know, a follower and fell into line with what they believe? No, why, why would they? And then the Buddhists who hold these manuscripts, these, are, you know, I, I purport these are honorable men of truth. They are certainly not in the, in the business of, um, of, of concocting any kind of uh, false documents. This isn't what they do. They are record keepers. Going back for thousands of years, they have faithfully recorded the words and teachings of holy men and have copied them and recopied them, you know, just as the Christian monks in the Middle Ages copied and recopied the New Testament to, to keep it alive and vibrant and old manuscripts wear out. 
So <clears throat> I, I feel that the evidence we, you know, we found on our film, these travels in India and the people we talk to and, 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 and film, is really strong support for the notion that Jesus uh, was, was in India during those years. Now, you might ask, what difference does that make? <laughs> Um, and it it makes a lot of difference. It it, it uh, implies an exposure to the so-called heathen religions of Buddhism and Hinduism, and in early Christianity, the earliest Christianity, spread by oral traditions, uh, gospels such as the Gospel of Thomas, which is one of the apocryphal gospels of the Gnostics that was found at it has very early sayings of Jesus, as well as the sayings that we know. There are hints of a early Christianity that is closer to Hinduism in some ways, closer to Eastern religion in some ways, than the Christianity that we ended up with you know, after the Council of, of Nicaea. So it's interesting from that point of view. It's also interesting from the point of view of the second part of the story, Bob, which you hinted at in your introduction at the beginning, and that is, that there are some who believe that Jesus survived the crucifixion and ended his days in Kashmir, India, which was a Jewish enclave at that time. And the film, the film is not saying that this is true. Jesus in India, the movie, is not taking the position that this is fact. What we are doing is saying that we want to sift through, the New York Times said this about our film, that we sift through the legends and myths and the evidence trying to separate myth from, from fact and evidence. And that's what we do. So we look at all of it. We look at all of these claims. It's the Ahmadiyya Muslims in particular who claim that Jesus survived the crucifixion and went back to India. It's particularly interesting how Ed Martin came across this. He was in the Peace Corps in Afghanistan and uh, drinking beer in the, in the commissary of the American Embassy, and he comes across a beer called Murray Beer. M-U-R-R-E-E, -E, made in Pakistan. And he thinks to himself, this is a strange name for a beer. Uh, you know, it's an English name. And he asks about it. Uh, he says, it's named after some English woman. And the Pakistani Christian bartender tells him, no, it's named after Mary, Mary, mother of Jesus, because she died in Pakistan when she was returning to India with Jesus. And she is buried there, and her tomb is there, and they named the town where the tomb is after her and called it Murray, a misspelling of Mary. Well, that's interesting. It turns out there is a 2,000-year-old tomb there that is revered by the locals as actually being the tomb of Mary. And it's only about 100 miles away from Kashmir where there's a tomb of the prophet, the Rose of All, which these Ahmadiyya Muslims also believe, they believe that is the tomb of the historical Jesus. Now, Christians would reject this out of hand, but it makes an interesting inquiry. Who is buried in that tomb? And why are there ancient carvings of the feet of that prophet showing the crucifixion wounds? Well, that segment of the film is extremely moving, uh, especially you, you also were introducing, uh, in, interviewing or talking with Suzanne Olson, yes, the author of Jesus in Kashmir, um, uh, Lost she, tomb. Yeah, yeah, she was researching what might be where Jesus' body was finally ready to rest. And her goal was to get some DNA from his body. And, from the uh, bones. She came very close. Yes, yeah, she actually. came. Yeah, yeah. But, but terrorism, uh, outbursts of violence prevented it. And we went there. I mean, the, the, the place is dangerous now in Kashmir, Srinagar. Americans should not go there. No one listening to the show should try to go there now. Uh, there's terrible violence. You could be killed. And it's on the State Department watch list. Um, but we, we did go there in 2005. And the, the, there were 13 people killed in the neighborhood where we were just like one or two days after we departed. Uh, we took a risk, and I sent my Hindu crew in to the area where that Rosabal tomb is uh, to talk to the local Muslims. It's in a, it's in a Muslim district there. Uh, who is this prophet that they call Yuzazov, who is buried at that tomb? And it, it is a 2,000-year-old tomb. And Yuzazov, Yuzis, it's, I mean, it's, it has sort of the sound of Jesus. Some say the name means Jesus the Gatherer. Others say it means uh, son of Joseph. Um, but uh, 
we uh, we don't hear much about this uh, tomb in the West, and uh, uh, you know the story has 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 not been told here. And we we tell it and uh, leave it to the viewer to evaluate uh, what kind of uh, credence you want to give to it. But but Bob, I think it's important to say in all of this, very important to point out that Saint Thomas, doubting Thomas. Doubting Thomas, who said unless he saw Jesus after the crucifixion and could touch his wounds, he wouldn't believe in that resurrection. And he did see uh, the wounds, and uh, he, he, uh, he believed. He was sent to India by Jesus, and no one disputes this in the Christian world. As a matter of fact, we know he was in Chennai, also called Madras, for 20 years preaching Christianity there. He brought Christianity to India. Many people in India today who are Christians describe themselves as Thomas Christians because they learned Christianity from St. Thomas. And his presence there was validated by Pope John Paul II, who went to India there, where St. Thomas Mount is, where the Basilica is, where the museum is to St. Thomas, and he went to pay homage there. So I ask you, if St. Thomas could get to India, Jesus could have gotten to India around uh, those same decades. And if Jesus felt India was important enough to send Thomas there to spread the Gospels, then uh, why is it so far-fetched that Jesus did this having been there himself in his youth, to this great center and country of ancient philosophies and learning in great temples. Why is that regarded as so far-fetched? I don't think it is. Well, certainly, certainly it's not. And, of no. course, uh, did you mention the St. Thomas Cathedral in Madras? Did you, you? I know you did in the film, of course, but uh, d when you were talking before, I don't know if you referred, referred to that, uh, the cathedral. It's quite an extraordinary place. Yeah, it's I, beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. Oh, wow. Beautiful. Yeah. And, of course, and, you know, as you note, Saint they Thomas, have a tomb uh, for St. Thomas there, where yeah. it's it believed his remains were, that they've been removed. But that's where uh, Pope John Paul II went. So there's an affinity in the Catholic tradition, through this visit by St. Paul, to the concept of one of Jesus' primary apostles, disciples, having been in India. So I think, you know, none of these legends are unknown to the Catholic Church. Um... I would like to see more openness about it. I mean, it's uh, there's a lot of possibilities here that are not not really being looked at. And I, I you, you, you know, here's a part of it that's kind of interesting, Bob. That the the, the Muslims, the Ahmadiyya Muslims, say Christianity has misinterpreted an aspect of the crucifixion, but they agree with Christians about part of it. You see, they agree that Jesus offered himself up as the Lamb of God that he offered himself as the sacrifice for mankind's sins. They, they, they don't argue with that. And it's clear from the scene in the Bible with Pilate and Jesus, when he's being condemned, that, uh, that he's, he's offering himself, he's offering his life. So did Jesus offer his life for mankind? Um, yeah, Muslims and Christians can agree on that. But Jesus said a prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, said, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass me. Please let it pass me, meaning uh, if, 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 if you can take this fate away from me of death on the cross, uh, that's what I pray to you. Now, in Christianity, it's interpreted that God answered that prayer of his son by saying, no, no, I will not, I will not grant you that prayer. You will die on the cross. The Muslims say Jesus offered his life, but God granted him that prayer because the Romans didn't finish the job. Well, um, that's no fault of Jesus. He did what the Messiah set out to do. He offered he offered his life, but that he can. You know, they believe that he, he 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 continued to live when he was put in that tomb. And the last two thousand years have shown us many examples of <clears throat> people who have flatlined. People who have been thought to be dead, even 15, 20 minutes, you hear uh, many validated stories about this from physicians, and then they're there. They're alive again. The heart starts to beat again. And what these Muslims believe is that uh, 
Jesus uh, recovered, did meet with all the disciples, that those parts of the Bible, uh, what Jesus said there with the disciples after the crucifixion, take it as true. Take it as true that he went to Damascus and he met Paul on the road to Damascus, but that uh, he, he didn't then, after 40 days, ascend to heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father. He went back to Kashmir. They believe. Again, I'm not saying this is true. I'm just saying, you know, hear it out, because Jesus did say to this generation, I give one sign, and it is the sign of Jonah. You'll find that in the Bible, and ask yourself, what, what could that mean, the sign of Jonah? The Jews know that Jonah was swallowed was inside the belly of the whale for three days, and he came out alive. He didn't come out dead. He didn't come out dead and resurrected. He came out alive. So there is a case to be made that there's a misinterpretation among certain branches of Christianity and that Jesus, uh, referring to the sign of Jonah, meant that he would live and that he did live. And he had many more years in Kashmir that are completely unreported in the Western world. So look, there, you know, there are people that think that John Wilkes Booth did not die in that barn in that fire after assassinating Lincoln but that there was a cover-up, you know, and he lived. And he, Some say he went to San Francisco, boarded a boat, went to London, appeared on the stage again in London. There are people who think that Hitler didn't die in the bunker. Uh, that wasn't his body. Hitler had doubles, just like Saddam Hussein had doubles. There's people that believe it was one of his doubles that was found there and that Hitler got out and lived out the rest of his life in South America. And if you think to yourself, just, just, just imagine... If you were one of the disciples and you had seen Jesus and the Romans thought that Jesus had been seen and he's supposed to be dead, and they come to you and say, well, you, you were seen with him. That was him, wasn't it? Well, you might say, no, no, that could not be him, sir, because he has gone to heaven to sit at the right hand of his father. You see, uh, could, could, that, could, could, the, you know, could the cover story have become the myth that now becomes the truth? Well, I think that's one of the important things about symbols and myths, because you can reveal and conceal depending upon what your audience knows. And we've got to take a break here. And when we come back, it might be then that the ultimate goal of uh, Jesus may have been to unite rather than to divide. Our guest is Paul Davids, Jesus in India, a 2008 film based on the book by Edward Martin, King of Travelers, Jesus' Lost Years in India. Go to JesusInIndiaTheMovie.com. This is 21st Century Radio, and I'm the alleged Dr. Bob Hieronymus, a lowly Ph.D. hanging out in this part of the universe, twisting the night away, and sometimes even twisting the date away. Our executive producer and research assistant, Laura Cortner, our engineer, is Jake Bryant. And the guest this hour is, uh, he was with us last half of, yes, last hour, it was Paul Davids. We're talking about the DVD, Jesus in India, a 2008 film based on the book. Well, it actually is based on the book, King of Travelers, by Ed Martin, Jesus' Lost Years in India. But, uh, Ed, Ed, Brother Ed, as we went on, Brother Ed is uh, an updated new version here, Jesus in India, King of Wisdom, the making of the film and new findings on Jesus' lost year. Now, And there are a lot of important people, especially the Dalai Lama that was interviewed in this book. And that's uh, let's touch on what Dal the Dalai Lama shared with you because the ultimate goal of locating these uh, these scripts um, was was kind of foiled in a way, which we'll get to a little later on. Is this what you'd like to get into at the moment? The Dalai, Dalai Lama. Lama. The Dalai Lama, yeah. Well, we, we were very fortunate to have the Dalai Lama in our film. Um, and he uh, wraps things up and addresses uh, the commonalities of the great religions and the needs that they fill for mankind and the importance of finding and creating religious harmony because we live in a time of great disharmony uh, and conflict. Now, the... The Buddhist monastery, Hemis, where we believe the uh, manuscript in question uh, resides, uh, we, uh, we, we attempted to get confirmation. And the monks we spoke to there, they neither confirm nor deny. 
well aware of the history of the stories about the document there. And uh, they uh, basically claim not to know where it is today there. They have a library of ancient documents and the translation projects stopped for quite some time. And uh, they, uh, again, they're, they're aware of it, but they say that no one individual could release that document if they found it, that it would have to be decided by committee. And they do express in the interview that you have subtitles for in the film the concern that, uh, that they could be accused of a cover-up mm-hmm. if they suddenly release this. So it's a weighty decision for them. Now, since the movie came out, I've had conversations with a number, a uh, couple of Westerners, two different Westerners, who were Buddhist monks in Southeast Asia at various times of their lives and were sent to Hemis Monastery. And both of these claim uh, that they, they had exposure to those documents, that they saw them, they confirmed that the documents exist, and they would both like to lead expeditions back there to gain access, to photograph them. Uh, there should be scientists and linguists involved. Uh, I don't think the dating of the document is going to give us the answer, because I don't expect the document that they have there that's in Tibetan to prove to be more than a few hundred years old. It's supposed to be a copy of a much uh, older uh, document that was in the Pali language, the older language, Tibet. Um, and, but if it's a copy of that older manuscript, uh, that older one may not exist. You know, I mean, China has had its run-in uh, with, uh, well, you know, China China has asserted its uh, oneness with Tibet, let's put it that way. <laughs> and in the process, uh, there have been periods of violence and there have been periods of destruction of manuscripts and monasteries and, uh, and Buddhists have undergone great hardship. So... The question of what still exists that may be very, very ancient is a tough question. We, we may never get the final uh, answer there, but we, we look for evidence and information about it wherever we can. Is the, um, is the weather damp in this area? Um, in the no, I don't, monastery? That, I don't think that these ancient manuscripts are, uh, they aren't, damaged and they don't decay the way that they would in, in more uh, humid places. It's a very mm-hmm. rarefied atmosphere. And that's a good atmosphere for, uh, you know, for preservation. Some of the ancient uh, documents, you'll see them in the film, are actually sort of cut into a, uh, well, it looks like stone. It looks like small stone tablets. And, uh, and then others are on a sort of a leathery substance. It might be a papyrus-like substance. But, you know, the scientists haven't been welcomed in there to study this. We haven't had the kind of access to that that has been had with, let's say, the Gnostic Gospels that were found in Nag Hammadi, Egypt mm-hmm. in 1948, I think it was. Yeah. Many Gospels found there. Or the Dead Sea Scrolls, which were found in uh, very bad condition, but, you know, preserved, studied, translated. This is the work to get these kinds of answers. But, you know, to to... To, to the critics who say, you know, Paul, you're you're engaged in biblical revisionism. Why are, you know, why go there? Why are you doing that? People regard the Bible as holy and sacrosanct and the Word of God. Uh, why is this kind of examination even appropriate? Well, I'd say first of all, there's a great deal of biblical scholarship that goes on today uh, that uh, is investigation of the the sources or the New Testament. Elaine Pagels of Princeton University appears in our film and discusses the Gospel of Thomas at length. Uh, So it's a valid inquiry. But also, it's not revisionism when you're filling a hole. Those 18 years of Jesus are simply not there. It's a black hole. And um, you can't revise something that isn't there. You could attempt to repair an omission, you see, he had to have been somewhere for those 18 years. Now, there are some in the film, uh, such as uh, the Vatican-accredited journalist, a devout Catholic named Michael Hesseman. And Michael Hesseman, who's engaged in some extraordinary biblical studies, I respect him very much, 
uh, he believes that Jesus was in a kind of monastic community in Judea during those years. A monastic community where you do not cut your hair with the scissors, where you totally devote your life to God. And uh, he, he, he says, look, as a Catholic, it doesn't upset him theologically if it's eventually proven that Jesus was in India. He says, why, why should it? The Gospel of John says that uh, you couldn't fill all the books of the world with uh, all of the things about the life of Christ. So why should that be such a surprise if it turns out to be true? But he says, as Christians, why should we, 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 don't, why should we believe it unless we have compelling evidence for it? So I've presented all the evidence we can find at this date, and I'm not telling my viewers what to believe. I'm asking them, does this constitute compelling evidence for you? And I think a lot of viewers do feel that there's compelling evidence and that the years have been filled in and that this broadens in a beautiful way the story of the life of Christ. Well, and speaking you... of the beauty, uh, Bob, you see all the biblical art that we have in the movie? It's extraordinary, the whole thing from that standpoint. So not only the Dalai Lama, but also Paramahansa Yogananda. Oh, the big guy. Brought this a great Hindu master who brought this mm -hmm. message. He wrote Autobiography of a Yogi. He founded the Self-Realization Fellowship, which, by the way, has endorsed our, our film by not only having a page devoted to it at their website, calling it Groundbreaking, but I was invited to go to the Mother Center of Self-Realization Fellowship in Los Angeles, and we showed the film to 40 monastics there, both monks and nuns, and what a standing ovation we received. Now, one of the representatives of Self-Realization Fellowship is in the film, Brother Chidananda of their publications division. Mm -hmm. And he uh, provides a, a uh, sort of a, a, a linking thread throughout the movie of, of pulling the different aspects of the story of the missing document to, together, but also points out that Yogananda himself claimed that the three magi of the book of Matthew were from India. We always know that these were magi from the East. Well, that's what it says in the Bible. As children, we sing, we three kings of Orient are, right? Bearing gifts, treasures from afar. But uh, there's nothing in the Bible that says that they were kings. So they were magi, wise men, astrologers. Uh, in India, they would say rishis, or elevated souls. And the gifts were gold, incense, and myrrh. And the Indians, the people of India point out that those three gifts in combination are a gift that is part of their tradition to give to high, elevated souls known to be such at birth. So this is the claim of Yogananda, that uh, a pull from India existed in Jesus' life from the earliest moments of his life. And it's reasonable to assume that at the age of 12 or 13 that he might have repaid that visit. After all, at 13 in the Jewish religion, one has a, a male has a bar mitzvah, becomes a man, according to tradition, and then becomes married at 13. Back in the days of Jesus, there would have been matchmakers. He wouldn't have gotten to age 14 without being married. If That's he correct, stayed. yes. Yeah. Let, let's yeah. return to that uh, after a break with our guest, David, Paul David's Jesus in India. And, uh, of course, uh, this is a film based on the book by Edward Martin. And Jesus in India, the movie dot com. And, of course, I think you wanted to mention something about the two books of Edward Martin and the soundtrack in the movie. Yes, I mean, you've talked uh, about how the book was inspired by Ed's first, uh, first book, how the movie was uh, inspired by uh, King of Travelers, Jesus' Lost Years in India. Mm -hmm. And you pointed out that Ed was on the show, uh, what was it, around 2002 or so? 2000. Uh, the year 2000. That was soon after that book came out. and. That book went out of print for a number of years, and uh, my uh, work in connection with the movie has been to get the book reissued, revised, updated, and so uh, it's available again now. King of uh, that's uh, King of Travelers, Jesus' Lost Years in India. You can get that at JesusInIndiaTheMovie.com. 
But the important thing also is that there is a second book by Ed that uh, I think he did just a terrific job that uh, deals with how this remarkable movie was made. I mean, during our months in India, he was writing all the time. The adventure, how did we get to see the people that we got to, what were the dangers, what were the obstacles, and what did we learn along the way. And when he presented that manuscript to me, I then wrote a foreword to it to put it all in perspective, and then an afterword to tell about the parts of making the movie after we got back from India, because we weren't done by any means. I, I went to London to talk to Araf Khan of the tombofjesus.com website. I went to Italy, the Vatican, talked to Monsignor Corrado Balducci. I went to Princeton University, spoke to professor and best-selling author Elaine Pagels. Dr. Paul Fleischman, a famous author up in Amherst, contributed. Then I went to uh, the Rourke Museum in New York. Then on to Georgetown University, where um, uh, professors Anthony Tambasco and Alan C. Mitchell contributed to the film. And I even went to Texas to talk to the fundamentalists in Ed's hometown who had rejected him for having spent so much time inquiring about Jesus in India and for having written a book about it. And they spoke and are in the film. And in the afterward, I included all the information about what was necessary to do to complete the film and to get it out. And, and it's been nationally released on the Sundance channel, which has been quite extraordinary. That second book is called Jesus in India, King of Wisdom. And the subtitle is The Making of the Film and New Findings on Jesus' Lost Years. So we have all of that available at the website, uh, one click away, uh, and also the CD of the music soundtrack. Bob, I have to ask you, what did you think of the music of the movie? Well, I loved it, and especially because um, when, you know, when you have to pause uh, and, and stop on the, uh, um, God, what's it called, the front page? Huh. Uh, the menu page. The the me thank you, thank you. Uh, I'm not too tired. But uh, <laughs> the menu page, it, you didn't keep playing the same music. It 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 it, uh, it always changed, um, and that I greatly appreciated because that's when I was able to hear hear larger segments of the musical pr uh, production. Well, even at the website, as soon as you enter the website, uh, we have uh, six minutes of music from the soundtrack. So everyone can get the flavor of it. it. It's a soundtrack that was done by composer Brian Lambert, who's so gifted. He's an extraordinary musician. He also did the music soundtrack for my last film called The Sci-Fi Boys, which is another DVD out there. That one's out from Universal. And uh, he's so talented, I hope to work with him again and again. But we did put all the music onto a CD to make it available uh, to I think there are even sites out there where you can download it, you know, mm -hmm. number by number of the different musical numbers. But uh, but uh, it's very nice to have the CD. Yes. Indeed. Soothing <laughs> as you're driving. It, hey, hey, Bob, you know, one thing we haven't talked about, I, you, you keep mentioning the Maryland Film Festival. When are we going to talk about the fact that I am a Marylander <laughs> and proud of it? Well, you, you began talking about it, and, of course, um, uh, our good friend... Uh, the director of it is Jed Dietz, and Jed, uh, I, I can't wait to get him copies. I'm going to be fortunately. You sent us some letters. You know, I grew up. I, I grew up in, in in Garrett Park. Went to Garrett Park Elementary School, and then I went to Kensington Junior High School in Kensington, Maryland. That mm -hmm. school no longer exists. Then uh, I lived in Bethesda, and I'm a graduate of Walter Johnson High School there. So all my formative years were spent in Maryland. And my father Isn't was a something? professor for 40 years at Georgetown University. That's oh, why we yeah. stuck so close to the Washington area. Yeah, I can see why now. That now begins to all fall together. Well, indeed. Uh, but I had still had a couple other questions here, because obviously sure. your work uh, should be shown here the, in a future Maryland Film Festival. Um, I, I'm looking forward to seeing those other pieces, because I haven't got been buried in other things. Now, but... Uh, uh, According to Ed Martin, Jesus studied both the Hindus and the Buddhists. Um, what, do you, what do you think he learned from those religions? 
Well, he, he certainly would have been exposed to time-honored beliefs in the East that are not present in mainstream Judaism, having to do with reincarnation. However, I understand that the Kabbalah, the mystical division or aspect of Judaism, does have reincarnation as an element. Yes, indeed, it but does. But the question of us having many lives and coming back mm -hmm. again and again uh, would have been one of the issues dealt with deeply as a result of exposure to Hinduism and Buddhism that, that, that didn't survive as part of Christianity after the Council of Nicaea. At the, the end of four centuries of Christianity, it was uh, became dogma that we have one life, and you, you go to one place or you go to the other. Mm -hmm. uh, now, another aspect of the Eastern religion is the feminine as well as the masculine aspect of, of God. In, in, in Judaism, uh, I, I don't think it's fair to say that there's equality between men and women, in, uh, certainly in ancient Judaism, and the sexes are separated in the synagogue. And, you know, but in, in, in Hinduism, you have this aspect of the Divine Mother. Yeah. You have the Heavenly Father, the Divine Mother. You have a female aspect to God. And this does show up in the Gospel of Thomas. It's definitely there. Uh, so this is something that, that could be an inheritance from, uh, from Eastern religion. Also, I think one aspect that did make it into the Bible, the quotation, If thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be filled with light. Mm -hmm. That is in the New Testament, and uh, in the world of the yogis, they feel that that applies to the practice of yogic meditation, where making the eye single, the concentration at uh, the point between the eyebrows uh, contributes to bringing an elevated uh, spiritual state of expanded or cosmic consciousness. And in Hinduism, they demonstrate this by uh, actually painting a little red dot on the forehead. Correct. You see that among Hindus, and that's what that replies to, the third eye if thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. And there it is in the New Testament, and there it is in Hinduism. And there it is on the back of the $1 bill on the Great Seal of the United States, the, the single eye, eye in the triangle. And it's extremely important because, you know, uh, one of the things, there are two things that our founding fathers really screwed up in setting up our Constitution. One dealt with the divine feminine and recognizing like they should have uh, from the League of the Iroquois and from the Cherokee especially that the women literally were in charge they were the ones that voted in the chiefs voted them out owned things controlled things etc and kept the peace mm. uh, we rejected the women from that perspective altogether and then also um, when you take a look at this aspect uh, the Native Americans also said that it was impossible for our nation to survive or continue long if we had slaves. We rejected both of those things. Mm -hmm. And so someday in the future, and I don't think it's going to come out of Hollywood anymore too soon, is going to be the story, the real story, about how the Divine Feminine, the League of the Iroquois, and especially when you get into the Jewish aspect of the, the same work that my wife has done in the Kabbalah and the Divine Feminine within the Kabbalah, is really going to hit maybe another 10, 15 years. I don't know how long it's going to take. But look at the progress we've made on, on both of those fronts. Yeah, we have made, we've made a lot of progress over the past 40, 45 years. No more slavery uh, in our country, and the uh, status of women... Um, and uh, progress, great, great progress in spite of all the things that uh, held us back for centuries. So was Jesus' ultimate goal, really, to unite all religions and nations? Well, you know, I think Father Baptiste, the Bishop of Borelli, said it really well when he said that you know, Jesus didn't set out to found a religion. What he founded was a way of life. And what he was most interested in, in this way of life, is that all people should be able to have a relationship with their Heavenly Father and uh, attempt to attain heaven through this relationship with the Heavenly Father. And he always spoke of uh, my Father. 
my Father who art in heaven. Mm -hmm. And I think if you catch on to that, you got it all. Well, I can't add to that because uh, I think you're about 122% correct there. You just passed your final exam, and now you <laughs> now you have five PhDs, Thank and that will increase your income by ten cents. <laughs> Except now you got to pay all the bills for <laughs> for getting there. Thank you. Th please hang on the phone before after we leave there, Paul. But uh, thank you very much for joining us. This is an extraordinary piece of work. I tell people visit us at JesusInIndiaTheMovie dot com. I think you will uh, you will be enriched by it. JesusInIndiaTheMovie dot com. 21st Century Radio is produced by Hieronymus and Company. Our executive producer and research assistant is Laura Cordner. Our engineer is Anita Brockington. And I'm Dr. Bob Hieronymus.